Okay, in this video we're going to look at the notions of a unit in a ring and a zero divisor in a ring, um, and then prove some kind of standard properties of integral domains. Okay, so for the definition of a zero divisor, so if we have A and B which are neither of them zero in a ring R, but we have the equation A times B equals zero, then A and B are said to be zero divisors of R. The next, if we have an element A in R and it has an inverse, then we say it's a unit. So we can reread that in the following way. So it's said to be a unit if there exists a B in R such that A times B equals one, where I put a subscript R here to mean that it's the unit with, uh, sorry, it is the identity within that ring. Okay, then the next thing we want to recall is that R is an integral domain if it is a commutative ring with one and has no zero divisors. So in a previous video we looked at Zn and we saw that if n was composite then it does have zero divisors. We didn't call them zero divisors in that case but that's actually what we proved. And so that gives you some sort of idea for what a zero divisor might be. You could also get uh, zero divisors in the world of uh, matrix rings and those are pretty easy to find as well. So let's take the element 1, 0, 0 and then uh, we can multiply that to the element 0, 0, 1 and notice that we will indeed get the zero matrix. And so that makes both of these matrices zero divisors. And you can obviously find uh, some more interesting examples of matrices like this that multiply to the zero matrix. Um, just as a um, hint of how to like construct your own, you can uh, find an invertible matrix P and you can multiply P, P inverse on either side of these two matrices. That's going to be the same thing as doing P, P inverse over here, which is obviously going to give you uh, the zero matrix, but you'll have a more interesting example of zero divisors within this matrix ring. Okay, so the, the first result that I want to prove uh, is as follows. So let's let R be a commutative ring with one, and then what we want to prove is that R is an integral domain if and only if for all non-zero A in R that satisfy an equation AB equals AC, that's going to imply that B equals C. So uh, let's go ahead and look at the proof here. So this is an if and only if statement, so we have two directions to prove. So let's prove this forward direction first. And so that means we want to suppose that R is um, an integral domain. And then let's see what else we have to assume. So we also need to assume that A is not equal to zero is within R and that AB equals AC. Great. And now let's look at our goal. Our goal will be to prove that this implies that B equals C. Okay, great. So let's see how we can get there. And so notice that AB equals AC. You might think that we're working in groups now and we can just multiply both sides of this equation by A inverse and we'll get B equals C immediately, but we're outside of the world of groups or fields in this case. We do not know that things are invertible, so we have to get around this somehow. And we can do that by subtracting AC from both sides. So that's going to give me AB minus AC equals zero. Okay, good, but that tells me that A times B minus C equals zero. Okay, so then that tells me that uh, A equals zero or B minus C equals zero. And why do we know that this is true? And so this is true because uh, we have an integral domain. Like this would not be true if we did not have an integral domain. Remember, integral domain means no zero divisors, which means if we have this product equaling zero, one of them has to be zero. But now what we see is that A is not equal to zero by our assumption, but that tells us that B minus C is equal to zero. In other words, B equals C which is what we wanted to prove for this forward direction. Okay, so I'll erase the board and we'll look at the reverse direction. So now we're ready for this reverse direction. 
So we want to prove that R is an integral domain. And um, how can we do that? Well, let's go ahead and suppose that um, we have a non-zero element from R and some other element B from R such that a times b equals zero. So remember, being an integral domain means that we have no zero divisors. So we want to start out with an equation that makes it look like we might have zero divisors and then prove that one of the parts of this equation is equal to zero, which shows that we indeed don't have zero divisors. So in other words, what we want to show here, so want to show that b equals zero. So a priori, we do, do not know this is true because we might have zero divisors. Okay, so now let's go on from here. So notice that this implies that a b equals a times zero. Okay, so it's pretty easy to prove that uh, a times zero is equal to zero for all um, a. Uh, I'll leave that to you guys. That's uh, generally a nice first exercise having to do with rings. But now we can apply this rule. So if AB equals AC, then B equals C. And what that tells us is that this is AB equals AC, where C is equal to zero. In other words, we get B is equal to zero. So, um, but if you look at the definition of an integral domain, um, that tells you that R is an integral domain. Okay, good. And so that finishes this proof. So I'll clean up the board and we'll look at another standard result. Okay, so the next result that we wanna prove is that every finite integral domain is a field. So let's recall that a field is an integral domain where every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So uh, let's see how this proof goes. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is set r star equal to all little r in r such that r is not equal to zero. In other words, this is what you get if you take the ring and view it as a set and then subtract the zero element, in other words, the additive, in, uh, the additive identity from this set. Okay, so now what we want to do is define the following set theoretic map from R star to R star. So we're gonna call it lambda A. So it'll go from R star to R star, and it will be defined in the following way. So we'll define lambda A on B is equal to A times B. And here I should say that A um, is an element from R and it's not equal to zero. So in other words, we've got a map from R star to R star, which just does left multiplication. So now the next thing that I want to show is that this map is indeed injective. And we can prove that in the following way. So let's go ahead and suppose that lambda A um, on B equals lambda A on C. But notice that's the same thing as saying AB equals AC. But by our previous proposition, since R is an integral domain, we know that this implies that B equals C. But that's exactly what it takes uh, for this thing to be injective. So that's the end of the proof that this is injective. Now the next thing that we want to notice is that injectivity plus r star is finite, so we know that the entire integral domain is finite, which means if you take away the zero element, it also has to be finite. It implies um, bijectivity. Which implies surjectivity, because 
Bijective is the same thing as injective and surjective. So I'm not gonna prove this. This is a fairly standard result about set theoretic functions. So what we know is that this function, which is left multiplication by A, is a surjective function. Okay, so I'll clean up this part of the board and then we'll use that surjectivity in order to uh, finish it off. So let's recall we had this function which was defined from R star to R star, which was given by left multiplication by this element A. And actually, we have a whole family of functions and all of these functions can be built from any non-zero element. And that's really important because the surjectivity implies that um, we can hit every element of R star um, by picking the right input, including one, which is obviously a non-zero element in uh, the integral domain, which means it has to be in R star. So maybe let's notice that. So let's notice that one is an element from R star. Great, but that means um, there exists some b in R star such that lambda a evaluated at b is this element one. But notice that lambda a evaluated at b is a times b. So what that tells you is that b equals a inverse. But now we know that since a uh, was an arbitrary non-zero element. Every non-zero um, element has an inverse. And by inverse, I mean multiplicative inverse. In other words, every non-zero element is a unit, which is exactly what we need to be true for this to be a field. Okay, so that finishes this proof, and this is a good place to end the video.